over 16 wilderness years. bleak May morning in 1994, Labour politicians gathered to mourn their leader, John Smith. His death severed a link with Labour's past. Smith, alone among his colleagues, had served in the last Labour cabinet. For 16 years, Labour politicians have languished in the wilderness. They've lost four general elections and their party has been riven by vicious internal conflicts. I mean, the problem of the Labour Party in the 70s and 80s is not complex or simple. Society changed and the party didn't. So you had a whole new generation of people with different aspirations and ambitions, a different type of world, and we were still singing the same old songs that people had sung in the 40s and 50s. I think the Labour Party has got to accept responsibility for its own failure, and uh, that does call for the most serious examination of what was wrong with the party. But, um, to condemn the country to 16 years of one-party rule, and particularly fanatical and ideological rule as it has been, is something which uh, the Labour Party should never cease to remind itself of. The tragedy has been for the people out there who needed a Labour government. And certainly the year since 1979 has been a tragedy for my constituents. Black, poor, unemployed, badly housed the defeats and therefore our performance have been a tragedy for the lowest paid 10, 20 percent of the population and we must feel some guilt about having behaved in a way which prevented us from coming to their assistance. In the 80s, Labour leaders failed to offer an appealing alternative and their response to nearly two decades of Conservative domination has been to shed many of the party's socialist ideals. I don't think anybody believed that you could have a Conservative government that would be able to maintain itself over four elections and remain in power uh, for what has been uh, 16 years. I think what Mrs Thatcher understood in 1979 was the need for change. I think what Labour failed to understand then was that change had to come about and that Labour should have been sponsoring change. And I think we've had to come to terms with that over a period of 16 years. I've seen so many failures based on the idea, give up everything you believe and you'll win. You give it up and you don't win. And then people say we didn't give up enough, so we've got to give up even more. And I think that is the tragedy, really, of the Labour Party since 19... Well, I suppose you say since 1974. It hasn't appeared to stand for anything. and People are not fools. They see that. So they say, better the devil we know. In May 1979, Britain's last Labour Prime Minister, James Callaghan, packed his bags and left Downing Street to make way for Margaret Thatcher. This is the Prime Minister coming out. This is the first time he has been seen. The strikes of the winter of discontent earlier in the year had made the fall of his government virtually certain. Labour, the party of the unions, had been locked in mortal combat with its own supporters over government pay policy. It was a bitterness that flowed from uh, the defeat in 1979 and the rival explanations, as it were, of what had caused that defeat. Um, it did uh, break, in many ways, the, the unity of the Labour Party, not for as it were, a short-term disagreement on policy, but it really shook the party to its very foundations. This is Mr. Callahan getting out of his large black rover to come into Transport House to meet uh, the party workers. Labour's leaders blamed the trade unions and the strikes during the winter of discontent for their election defeat in 1979. 
the workers voted against the consequences of their own irresponsibility. And that, of course, is what put uh, Mrs. Thatcher in, because um, half the members of trade unions voted for parties other than the Labour Party in that first vote which put Thatcher in, because they were so disgusted the way their own unions had behaved. But the left of the party charged the leadership with abandoning socialism and adopting conservative policies instead. The tension within the party, uh, generally, and within the trade unions, got uh, uh, more and more difficult to contain because uh, they felt that they had been let down. That was the feeling, but the loyalty to the government was such that uh, they stuck by the government, but as soon as the government was defeated in 79 and that bond of immediate loyalty uh, was uh, lifted by defeat, then, of course, all this pent-up feeling began to emerge. And, of course, I shared it because I'd seen it from the inside. A number of factors made it possible for demagogues, by demagogues I principally mean Tony Benn, to say this is what is wrong with the Labour Party. Your leaders betray you, your leaders are really Tories in disguise, the policy is never genuine socialism, it's always capitalism dressed up to look like something different. And because of the despair of 79, the party was in a mood to believe that. The Labour Party for two or three years wasn't an opposition at all. It was an opposition to itself, it was, there was an internal opposition. Uh, there was a civil war in the very real sense of that term. Stop Thatcher's war drive! All the facts and arguments, 20 pence. Tony Benn's rejection of the party leadership came at the same time as a surge in the influence of the left. No British solution! No British solution! In the wake of the election defeat, the anger of the activists found an outlet in their struggle to reform the party. Their aim was to ensure that in future, party leaders stuck to the policies agreed at conference. Tony Benn threw his whole weight behind the campaign for Labour Party democracy. <laughs> In Tony Benn, the left had found a charismatic figurehead. Their drive to revolutionise the party took off. I do think much of it must be attributed to the uh, leadership uh, of Tony Benn. That's, the, I think, the first time, perhaps since Anar and Bevan, which was 20 years previously, that the left uh, had within their ranks someone clearly of leadership potential, uh, who was an inspiration, uh, who had a, a grand vision, who had a sense of purpose, and who was a brilliant communicator. There is no prospect whatever of changing the future of this country for ourselves and our children or the future of the world for humanity at large unless we can enlarge the area of democratic responsibility so that what the people want can be realized through their institutions. He had a grand vision of socialism. He wanted to see a different order. He was passionately opposed to the technocrats who simply took a view that we can manage the capitalist system better than the Tories or the capitalists. He wanted to do away with that. He wanted to do away with the old order, and if need be, that meant doing away with the old order within the Labour Party. Tony Benn rejected the watering holes of Westminster in favour of the local Labour club. His socialism derived from Karl Marx, the Bible, and the heroes of the English Civil War. I don't think he was ambitious for himself, but he had this wonderful image of the working class. It was rather like the noble savage sort of thing. And I used to have to bring him down to earth sometimes. I think he came from a, a rather aristocratic background. Uh, and he, he enjoyed the company. He was never happier than in a miners' institute or uh, among working people. He liked their company, he liked the way they were open and honest and had a pint of beer and uh, he enjoyed being with them. And they looked up to him and they respected him. And, and it really was a bit like the Governor General of Yorkshire, you know, or something like that. He was always a charming and uh, delightful uh, speaker, public speaker. 
but he seemed to develop a much greater persuasiveness and, and, and magnetism as a public personality as the 70s wore on. So the shipbuilders, you know, 